everybody. Um, I feel like I just, you know, just left the stage. I'm, I'm glad to be back. It's wonderful to be in Austin. Uh, <laughs> this one's going on the list. Um, you know, I've seen a lot of code this morning, so um, I want to show you some code that I wrote recently that prompted me to kind of like write this talk. And um, I work with a lot of junior developers, and one of them said to me um, a couple months ago, she, she said, I want to be you when I grow up. I'm like, oh, but I'm a fuck up. Uh, before I go any further, uh, I suppose I actually do need to do a couple trigger warnings. Uh, first, a trigger warning for the trigger warning. I swear in the trigger warning. Uh, trigger warning, I do kind of have a, po have a potty mouth, uh, and I apologize for that. Um, I will try to tone it down. The second thing is, um, actually, on a serious note, um, I do have a couple of animated GIFs, so if you have any sort of uh, motion issues or DZY uh, accessibility concerns, um, I do apologize. Uh, in future versions, I will edit and uh, remove those. So, sure, to hug this mic. Okay, so let me show you some code. What did I do wrong? Anyone spot it? Yes! Where were you when I started those two hours of my life? I did this six weeks ago. I've been a web developer for 20 years. I've been writing HTML code for 20 years, and I forgot that. Now, granted, there was a whole bunch of like ng data angular bullshit in there, but still, right? Like I'm clicking the submit button and nothing happens. And I'm like, it's got to be, it's got to be angular. There's a reason I call it angular, because it makes you feel like this guy. Any baseball fans out there? Raul Abanez, a man who takes pride in his defense. Hate this guy. I've got like six more, but I won't. I won't. We'll skip those. Um, one of my devs I work with uh, said this to me. You know, and it's really true. Like anytime, like I'm finding a bug and I'm trying to fix it, and the solution is more than six characters, I stop because I'm rewriting something. You know, like I'm fundamentally changing the way the software actually works at that point. Generally speaking, right? It's almost always like a missing comma or semicolon or you know. Uh, white space if you're in one of those languages. So, I mean, that's a kind of a, a nice reminder to me. And I was doing everything under the sun. I was cracking open Angular. I was searching Stack Overflow. I was looking through, you know, uh, Angular's issue tracker at one point. I mean, it was, I got kind of crazy. Uh, you know, and this, this sort of like lesson that, you know, you know what? The bug is never in Ruby. The bug is never in Rails core. It's your code that's wrong 99% of the time. One time, one time I found the bug in Ruby. And it was already a bug that everybody knew about. So it wasn't that exciting. So I posted this, and it got a whole bunch of retweets. Um, and my favorite reply came from Microsoft, which I was like, how's that Windows 8 working out for you? Uh, earlier, uh, there was a hippie up on the stage who kind of buried the lead about her uh, alma mater. Go moon bats. Um, but while I was at Goddard College, uh, I was actually a performance major. Um, I, I, I thought I was going to be a stagehand, basically, a lighting and set designer. And I did that for a number of years. Um, and one of, the, one of the performances that I absolutely loved was the Scottish play. Um, and uh, one summer I got to do it and Henry V and Richard III uh, in a repertory theater. So every night we're doing a new, a new production. And it's such a small company, you were a stagehand and I was a messenger. Um, and so one night you know, in a production to Macbeth, you know, I go on stage and Macbeth has just received the tragic news that his wife has committed suicide. And it's, you know, he gives the famous, you know, tomorrow and tomorrow and tomorrow creeps forth at this petty pace from day to day into the last syllable of recorded time. And then the messenger, myself, bursts in on stage and tells him, Burnham Wood is marching on Dunsinane, which is, uh, fulfills the, the mad witch's prophecy of his downfall. Uh, the problem is, is that um, I wasn't actually in a production of Macbeth. <laughs> uh, uh, King Henry, uh, or King Hal, uh, looked over at me and You know, they, they say it's never the mistake, right? It's the recovery. So what could I have done in that situation, right? But my lord, that doth not that doth, that news doth not concern thee. <laughs> no, I say, oh shit. <laughs> Which, while technically, you know, Elizabethan English, you know, not good for the uh, you know the dinner crowd. It's it's always the cover up, 
you know, that's what gets you. <laughs> so without any other jokes, um, <laughs> liar, uh, I want to tell you about my very, very, very first job. I worked for this little tiny uh, web design company called Level 9, and it was named after the ninth I Ching, whatever, some bullshit. Um, but, you know, we were doing like cold fusion and Perl based sites, um, uh, PHTML, if you remember that, or SHTML, uh, back in the, in the mid 90s. And I got the job because I was one of only 50 applicants who had heard of the internet, <laughs> which, you know, that was pretty awesome. Um, I had um, not gotten a, uh, a touring gig that summer as a stagehand, so I needed to find work. I needed to pay for things. And I, I, I knew enough about computers to kind of fake it for the first few weeks while I maddeningly read, you know, HTML in 24 hours. Um, and uh, the job just kind of took off. But you know, it was the 90s. Man, we did not know what we were doing. Uh, if you think the, pl the plethora of JavaScript frameworks is insane, you have no idea. Uh, does it, this look familiar to anybody? Okay, um, those of us who recognize it, um, I was at IHOP this morning. Their Tuesday discount will be going tomorrow. Uh, show your AARP card. Um, yes, this is uh, VRML or Vermal. Virtual, rea virtual reality markup language. Uh, this was going to be the hot new thing. And somehow I <laughs> managed to convince a, uh, a client, uh, a local news station, who were very impressed with our three simultaneous webcasting at six frames per second of their newscast uh, to give us $35,000 to build a virtual marketplace where you could like wander through and purchase things from their advertisers. Uh, I don't think we actually shipped that. That was six months of my life. Uh, QuickTime VR, that was a hot thing. Remember that? Uh, we, this was back before digital cameras were even hot, and so you actually had to get this special camera on a motorized mount that made these very long film strips like this that you put on a scanner in sections and then paste it together and then use the $2,000 Apple proprietary software. And this was Apple pre-Jobs, by the way, so it fucking sucked. Um, and, uh, you know, I had to go to like a week-long workshop that cost my company $5,000. You know, it was like literally like $15,000 my company spent. And um, on my say-so, I said, this is the thing, right? This is the bomb. Uh, we never sold a thing. But I know a lot about camera focus angles and lenses now. My career really took off. Uh, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Somebody's computer crashed out there. I heard that. Uh, I, I apologize for that. Um, I was part of that generation that made all of your website splash pages suck, um, but it paid the bills. Um, I did a, a fun little basketball game for the Basketball Hall of Fame in Springfield, Massachusetts, and uh, on the strength of that, got hired um, at a little bookstore in Seattle um, that you might have heard of. Um, uh, somewhere in the six weeks between uh, hiring me to be an action script Flash developer and my showing up on, for day one, um, they canceled the project. No more Flash for Amazon. Um, but they hired me, so you know they figured I know what I was doing. Yeah, here's a Unix desktop. <laughs> I've been using a Windows NT machine for the last eight years, so like, okay, system admin, I don't know. Um, but I kind of faked it for a while uh, because you know the state of Amazon in the early aughts, their software, uh, this is this, it was it was a mess. It was a, one giant monolith C. Um, uh, two gigabyte compiled thing called Obidos. And we all used this special little like C macro language that someone had written uh, and extended until like it was actually Turing complete, the scripting language to act, work with the C uh, binary. It was pretty horrible. Um, but I did five years there on the personalization and discovery team, which really meant that I was a cold, heartless robot that used algorithms to fire people. Um, we would price in the headcount of the number of people we could remove by doing an optimization. It was, it was pretty brutal. Um, basically, anything you read in the papers about how awful Amazon is, I gotta say, you know, yeah. <laughs> During my time there, uh, around 2002, 2003, um, I was seconded to the email team because, you know, they, they needed a little, like, boost in motivation. <laughs> Sending one of us to work on your team was, like, that was bad. Um, and so I was tasked one day with sending out an email um, about the latest uh, top-selling opera book to everyone who had signed up for um, info, you know, the opera newsletter. You know, email me when new books come out, right? That's kind of cool. And I love email. Um, you know, like email is this really great direct marketing tool. You can really reach out and make connections with people. And you can like track the click through rates and everything. Um, unfortunately, uh, Opera and Oprah are right next to each other. 
Um, yes, so the book about the opera instantly became a number one top seller, and business people were trying to figure out what the hell we did to make that sell so well. So that was, that was a pretty clear mistake, and I got in a lot of trouble for it. But why was I allowed to make that mistake? Right? Like, why wasn't there a confirmation box, or like multiple steps, or like somebody who knew what the hell they were doing actually scheduling these emails instead of, you know, a new developer on her like second or third day on the team? Um, I appreciate the, the trust, but maybe it was a little misplaced. Um, but the cool thing about that is um, it reminds me of Play-Doh. You all know how Play-Doh was invented? Okay, this is a great story. There was this guy, okay, and his job was to come up with a better kind of wallpaper cleaner. Did you know there was a kind of wallpaper cleaner to begin with? <laughs> I certainly didn't. Um, so anyway, this guy, you know, tries to figure out this wallpaper cleaner. I guess you would like smear it on the wall and peel it off or something. Um, you know, but he tried, he, he came up with a kid's toy instead. Non-toxic, of course. But it's that idea that like, even our failures are these great opportunities to experiment. Whether it's, you know, I've talked a lot about that with, with my students and in my talks about like that idea that like failure is this, this learning opportunity for you to like understand how something changes and how, what the limits of your knowledge are. Um, but from a business perspective, it's also a really interesting thing because the normal state of your code is now your control. And your failure state is your, is your experiment. You're doing a natural A-B test against your actual live running code and you can discover some really interesting things about your, your uh, website's behavior or your, the way that your software handles stress, all those sorts of things. Those are really available if you have a really healthy engineering culture that can do things like postmortems and learning reviews um, and you don't fire people just because they bring the website down in December you know, during Christmas season when it's about you know, $300,000 an hour in sales. And, Oh, good times, good times. I love Amazon. The shock treatments like really helped and like got me over those. All right, my next story. Um, so how many people have hired somebody who just absolutely sucked? Like honestly. Okay, not as many hands as I would expect um, given how afraid we seem to be about hiring somebody who sucks. And either says that our process is really good for filtering those people out, so we should just trust it and go with it. Or maybe there's just not that many bad people out there that we're hiring. Because I almost never work with a bad person, except for Dimitri. <laughs> now, Dimitri got hired with this really awesome pedigree. Um, you know, he, he had a master's degree. He was working on his doctoral in computer science. He had worked at several startups. Um, and my startup was so lucky to get this guy. He was going to be our new head of engineering. He was just going to do everything right and make everything happy in the world, and we're going to make millions of dollars and like move to islands. Um, the reason there's a Porsche on this slide is because we gave him a very healthy signing bonus, which he spent on a Porsche, um, which he talked about in stand-up three times a week. He would start off with this whole speech about how like how the traffic was to get there in his Porsche, and he would park, you know, in like very conspicuous spots you know, and like offer rides to people. And he was kind of a jerk and an asshole. And uh, one day, actually, um, my, my boss called me on a Friday night, six o'clock, and said, hey, we're letting, we're letting Dimitri go. It's been three months. All he's done is write eight pages of documentation about something that we're not going to use. That's all he'd done in three months. Um, so, okay, they're going to let him go. Carrie, I need you to go in and delete all of his passwords, all of his accounts, so that he doesn't, like, you know, rage quit and, like, delete stuff. Fine, right? That's pretty standard. I mean, you know, we're a very small company. We didn't have an HR or a policy for this yet. Um, so I went in and I hard deleted all of his accounts, all of his passwords. Uh, my boss calls me an hour later and said, hmm, I think we changed our mind. So Monday comes around. <laughs> Dimitri wants to know why he can't get into his email. I don't know. Don't ask me. And of course, like, we all knew, we all knew on the team, because, like, immediately, like, when I deleted everything, like, I told the rest of my team, I'm like, hey, by the way, if Dimitri contacts you for any reason, please let, you know, myself know, or, you know, our, our head of engineering then. Um, so they all knew he had gotten fired, and now he's showing up on Monday, and they're like, what are you doing here? So it was kind of a bad scene. Um, and it 
we let him. We eventually let him go two weeks later, uh, and he did actually rage quit and delete a bunch of stuff. But <laughs> a backup sucker. This is a super dysfunctional uh, company, and at this point in its life cycle, uh, it started like six of us in a garage. We'd gotten up to about 30, 35 at that point. I was really mad. I was really mad. I was just tired of this bullshit all the time. So, uh, like any good hippie socialist, I wrote a manifesto. Um, that's the link to a, a re somewhat redacted and uh, not so cursy version on that website that I, I posted a few months ago. Um, and, uh, you know, when you hit this point of just like, you just give up, right? And, you know, I actually had a little model of a table, like a dollhouse table on my desk for a while with like teacups and everything it was all set so I could uh, and just scatter. And it felt really good. I've mellowed out now. I've mellowed out. So in this email, I. This is really distracting, isn't it? Um, so in the email, I, uh, I ended up like actually telling my boss, no, you're the problem. It is your bad leadership that's gotten to us to this point. You're not running this company well. You need to fire yourself. You're the CEO. You can't be doing this, all this sort of stuff. And uh, I expected to be fired. I mean, he just, he just fired, then unfired, then fired this guy, right? Um, so uh, <laughs> this is what he came back with. Good job. So uh, now I'm the head of engineering. Now it's my fault. Um, and so there's this idea that, like, you know, like even though I did this completely crazy thing, it was self-destructive. Somehow I landed on my feet in that situation, and I got a promotion because I told the truth. Because I said, "Hey, this is wrong, and I want to fix it. And this is this is how we're going to fix it. Not just I've got some complaints, and you're going to fucking listen to me." But hey, I've got some problems. Here's what's going wrong. Here's the solution. And so I've always taken that lesson that like, don't bring complaints up. You bring solutions up. And uh, somehow people start thinking that you're good at your job when you do that. I, I don't know. It seems like this weird adult trick that I never learned because I went to hippie school. OK, I'm going to show you some pseudocode now. Uh, a few years ago, I worked for a, um, a uh, Ruby and Rails hosting company. Um, I'm not going to mention their name. Some of you may be doing business with them. Um, one of the little side businesses that we had was uh, handling uh, domain name processing, uh, registrations and renewals, those sorts of things, right? Um, and so we had a bulk deal uh, with some third-party registrar service that would charge us $12 a thing. We would charge our customers 15 Excuse me. So we made about $3 per registration. You all with me so far? We make $3 per domain name. Okay, here's, here's what our code did. Uh, so for each domain name the client had uh, that is due for a renewal, we're going to queue up a rescue job. Uh, we're going to bill the client on our internal accounting system. Uh, then we're going to use our company's credit card to renew the domain. Uh, if, the re if the registrar returns any error, literally rescue, <laughs> uh, we're going to retry. Uh, we're going to time out after three attempts, uh, and we'll just, re we'll just requeue this whole job and start over in about five minutes. Anyone see the fatal flaw in this? <laughs> yeah. Um, so what we noticed uh, was our largest customer, a six-digit a, six uh, a month customer, 100, 120,000, uh, got a new CFO. And uh, he said, hey, I noticed about five months ago our bills went up quite drastically. Can you explain that? <laughs> so um, this was the key problem for us. Uh, we were using our company's credit card to try to register. Unfortunately, its expiration date had expired. So we would try to renew this three times and then requeue the entire job. Five minutes later, we would charge the customer again another $15. So you can do that math and figure out how much we were overcharging the customer every day for every one of their domain names, for every customer. I'm not, going to I'm not going to tell you what Git Blame said about who did that because, you know, I think it's really petty and, and shallow to, to, to look to lay blame on people. Um, it took us about a week and a half to figure this out. And so you start doing the math, right? And uh, I did the math and I said, you know, we've got to get out of the domain name business. We're, we're, taking, a, we're taking a beating. Like, we're only making $1,800 a year on this service. Um, 
And the same thing happened last year, but the, the, the developers who fixed it last year didn't really fix it. They just like manually redid all the jobs. And like then they left, right? So, so two years in a row, we lost money on domain name registration. registration. Uh, this kind of this kind of math and uh, ability with uh, money. Um, if you believe that this is good, um, I want you to meet somebody. His name's Ray. Um, happy to take your money. So, the thing I love about software. And the thing that I'm learning about software after 20 years, I'm starting to learn this, is that there are two kinds of complexity, right? There's inherent and applied complexity. And some things are just complex, right? Some things are complicated. Some things are difficult. Software can exist in these different states, and we have to, we have to grapple with that. But then there's this idea of applied complexity. And those are the problems that we introduce because we're humans because we exist within a framework of how we believe code should be developed, um, how it should be delivered, how it should be managed uh, over time. Uh, Zaslav Vizek um, had this wonderful quote about ideology. And it's this idea that you know, ideology is a set of lenses that we view the world through. However, Ideology isn't a thing in and of itself. It doesn't bring anything new to the situation. What ideology does is merely open up the, the abyss of the present. That's on your sheets, yo. It's a bingo word. The abyss of, of something. I'm sorry? Yes, your ideology is in fact insufficient for dealing with the kinds of complexity that we, we work with. Very often, we're approaching this from a very a sense of things are what they are. A equals A. It's almost an objectivist, if anyone is familiar with Randian uh, object objectivism, right? The code speaks for itself. The code is correct. No, the code is not correct. The code is merely an expression of someone's ideology about how a problem should be solved, about what the best way to do it within the context of the time that, that code was written. It is when we apply a more romantic, uh, if you will, ideology to go along with that, to say not what is the code, but what does the code mean? What is the sum total of it? What is it beyond simply the facts of it? What problems does it solve and who does it solve them for? Those sorts of problems are the ones that failure exposed to us. When we, when we find a bug, or we cause a bug, we can look at process. We can look at, well, maybe you're just not a good developer. We can say, well, maybe we need to do more testing. We can, we can do all those sorts of things. Maybe we have to fire you. Um, but ultimately, as a developer, and as a manager of developers, when my developers cause these sorts of problems, when they cause bugs and errors and cost the comp these companies sometimes lots of money. In the postmortem process, in the learning review, I point out and I bring up the fact that our ideology has now changed. We can no longer assume that that will never be nil, that an outside user will never somehow get behind our firewall. That would never happen. We will never accidentally drop all tables from production. Uh, too, too soon? Too soon? Okay. I wasn't even there then, man. It wasn't my fault. So when we start to question our ideology, it, it's an opportunity for us to question our ideology, to look at the lenses through which we're viewing um, the process of software and the process of how we're doing it. In my career, I was never strapped to a rocket and given high fives on the way up. You know, I've made all of these mistakes, and every single one of these mistakes, I thought, that's it. I'm done. I'm gonna get fired. Luckily, I can fall back on this like punning poker player hippie thing. I guess I could follow fish or something, you know. But every single time, what it turned out to be was it made me a stronger developer. It made me see that failure states of code exist. 
you know, that I question myself and I respect the code and I understand it in a more intuitive way because I see how it can fail. It is no longer a collection of parts that were put together in some other far off factory, but I can see now the subtle interplay between disconnected pieces of that system. I become more in tune with it. I have more of a material, tactile sense of that code and how it operates under different conditions. Something that's on the diagram on this side breaks and this thing over here breaks? How is that? I understand that now. I come to a fuller understanding of it. In poker, we talk about this idea that you're only ever playing one poker game your entire life, right? Sometimes players will come and go and sometimes the entire table will change, but it's always the same game because the only constant that you have that you can control is yourself. And if you're playing against a specific player and you lose or you win, that has no bearing on the next hand or the next day or the next month, no matter what you might think or how superstitious you are. And in a very similar way, the code is all one repository through our entire lives. Sometimes the problems change. Sometimes the technology changes. Sometimes the people we're working with change. But we are that constant. And it's what we are bringing to that code, our experiences, and yes, our ideology, that will inform us and make us the best developers we can possibly be. Thanks, y'all. <laughs>